Chapter Nineteen of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunday morning in Winchester. Sunday morning in Winchester, and so far the coldest, the brightest, the breeziest morning of all. In the cathedral close, the leaves were flying grey pigeons fluttered here and there on the vast front of the cathedral or lanced down through the sunlight the transverse paths in the close were thronged with people all hurrying towards the west door and over all far up in the blue sky it seemed a solemn deep-throated bell tolled for service its hoarse voice strangely varying as though the wind drove the sound about just as it was driving the red lime leaves this was no ordinary sunday that i had chanced upon in winchester the autumn assizes were being held and to-day the judges would attend the cathedral service in state escorted thither by the mayor and corporation in full regalia i had been warned that if i would secure one of the coveted seats in the chancel between the choir stalls and the sanctuary i must get there betimes but even thus early all the town seemed to be flocking towards the cathedral i made what haste was decently possible and found myself at length on one of the foremost benches whence i had an uninterrupted view down the vast nave with most cathedrals the immediate effect of being in them is to make you think of other cathedrals an endless array of comparisons springs up in the mind and the pleasure that you might have in what is before you is often discounted by the memory of something finer farther away but winchester has this unique quality that once you have passed its door it is the only cathedral in the world for you other great and beautiful churches are greater and more beautiful it may well be but the loveliest and grandest of them is only built of stone while winchester is built of air and sunlight and not only that the very life of the air is in its soaring snow-white intricacy of column and arch so that every cloud that dims the sun changes it bodily and the travelling light forms and dissolves and forms again its aerial masonry giving you the impression of a great white rose expanding its multitudinous petals under your very eyes so it seemed to me as i sat in the crowded chancel waiting for the arrival of the judges and their municipal escort through the towering choir screen black with the venerable blackness of age which is never sombre the whole vast nave was visible the sunshine coming aslant through the windows of the eastern isle struck only upon those wonderful fluted pillars leaving the bays between quiet in twilight and giving to the nave an appearance of immeasurable length and height i tried to estimate the girth of the great columns the span of the arches the real altitude of the forest roof of white tracery overhead the distance between the reredos carved out of the same summer cloud-like stone and the west door open and framing in a vivid rectangle of autumn crimson and gold but the thing was impossible human ideas of mensuration seem to fail here as they fail in the night star house of the ether it was not that you were brought face to face with utter boundlessness it was that there was nothing here to measure nothing that began or ended nothing that kept solidity or dimension for more than a moment 
in the sunlight incessantly flowing or waning to and fro in the shadows for ever changing place and form and intensity in the very air of the place that seemed to have a mirage power of hiding the real stone while giving shape and substance to the mere dust motes there was the same irresistible feeling of growth of a beautiful expanding and soaring efflorescence as though we wandering children in the wilderness had stopped here to make holy ground for worship and forthwith the cloudy pillar had enveloped us leaguing with the sunshine to build us a tabernacle out of mist and light a strange silence the whispering rustling silence that always holds where a great congregation is brought together dwelt in the entire cathedral the bell still tolled making a solemn sweet booming sound very quiet and far away the minutes crept on at length this bell stopped and high up in the cathedral tower the clock began to strike drone through its eleven muffled mighty notes then seemed to leave the whole building vibrating in a deeper silence than ever for all the whispering and rustling had abruptly ceased all eyes were now turned towards the far-off western door where out in the wind and leaf-winnowed sunlight another crowd was gathered i could hear the low tumult of their voices strangely contrasting with the hush close wrought expectant that was over the great concourse within i looked at the sea of rapt intent faces around me i knew that my own face showed the same eagerness the same downright excitement and i asked myself were we agog with all this strained expectancy really because of the thing that had ostensibly brought us here the two seemed out of all proportion there we were standing on tiptoe neck craning beyond neck every eye fixed on that patch of far-off flickering sunshine just for what to all but me must long have grown a familiar spectacle coming twice in each year of our lives what it really was that moved so strangely the other units in the crowd was known probably not even to themselves instinct brought them there they stayed they went home again the impulse gratified but for myself an old and often inconvenient habit of analysing emotions seemed to give a clue to the situation i had come to the cathedral for the place itself with but a casual almost languid interest in what i was to see yet twenty minutes waiting in that vast quiet cavernous place had wholly transformed me why i asked myself again and the answer seemed to be that though i cared little for church-going judges and corporations i cared a great deal for what they alone could now bring me that long wait in the cathedral wherein i had drunk my fill of the beauty of form rightly the one appeal of architecture had left me hungering and thirsting for the other two that go to make the trinity of perfect beauty generous colour and sound in the whole wide space there was the blackness of the carven oak and the wreathing pale loveliness of the stonework but of colour almost nothing and of music only the one dim reiterated tone no wonder those who pass so much of their lives in the wan hueless precincts of these great churches delight to make of their ritual a feast of music and colour it becomes the necessity that knows no law if at that moment the very pope of rome had filled protestant winchester with all the glittering mitres and monstrances 
all the flaring perambulation of gold and purple in his great sea i for one should have been only delighted and edified i stood staring down the misty sunlit glade of the cathedral ripe and ready for the bravest that legal or civic pomp could show the silence just then seemed too profound to be broken by anything short of a thunderclap but as the cutting of a silken cord launches a great battleship the merest thread of music now brought our whole great house of quiet tumbling about our ears outside in the rippling sunshine of the cathedral close there rang out one long dim fanfaronade of trumpets and at once the waiting choir burst forth a hundred voices it seemed led by the great organ sent the strains of the national anthem flooding to the roof the procession began to pour up the nave the white surplice singing choir the priests the judges the garrison commandants the mayor with aldermen and councillors in train scarlet of divinity and scarlet of law scarlets of municipal and military power gold glint of uniforms college hoods in crimson and white and blue the rich deep purple of the councillor's robes and the bedizened beadle carrying his shining mace on high the whole stream of luxuriant colour came flowing up the wide nave up the chancel steps and drew to rest in the place of honour reserved for it amidst the old black filigree of the stalls every gleam of prismatic light and every note of that grand symphony came to me like rain after drought eyes and ears drank deep drank again and again while the judges in their wigs and ermine capes settled down to their places and the mayor rustled into his throne behind the mace and the officiating priests got out their holy books for the service to come the music died away the silence gathered again and in the midst of it came one low clear note from the organ followed by words that all but startled an exclamation from my lips i will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son here was an absolutely astounding thing the very words i had heard a week before in the little church on ilchester marshes raised in exhortation to a crowd of poverty-stricken peasants were chosen now to admonish this exalted company high-placed clerics and eminent judges gallant master-soldiers the chief dignitaries of a great provincial town here they were all together ready to kneel in prayer on the fine carpets of a cathedral at call of the same simple words that had brought the yokels to their knees on the drugget of the little village church i was startled i say at this obvious inevitable thing i know and knew then that i had no more reason to be startled than at the sight of blue in a summer sky but for all that it came to me with intensely novel awakening force for we live all our lives under the shelter of great truths and just because they are common universal eternal we seldom think of looking up to see what blesses us sunshine the air the bread-giving earth the catholic faith shall we in their full enjoyment ever be great enough to estimate them at the price of their loss i had listened to the old english morning prayer in many churches great and small 
but never with so much delight and profit as there in the crowded chancel of winchester it was leisurely and staid and reverent quietude hastlessness were the dominant keynotes through all and the music seemed to me the last thing in refined beauty it was good to see the worldly old judges the apple-faced mare and the gorgeous beadle singing out lustily together good to see all kneeling scarlet and homespun high and low in the same common brotherhood of prayer and when sermon time came and the judge's chaplain mounted the pulpit instead of one of winchester's usual mentors it was good to see dean and canons and prebendaries settling down to listen with the humblest layman there he was a personable man the judge's chaplain a fine stalwart thick-set man with a woolsey face and carriage admirably set off by his flowing black silk robes his cambric weepers his durham hood of brilliant blue he began with the usual long and quaint exhortation to prayer for all manner of things under the sun delivered with much sonorousness and formality this done he faced squarely about studied the elements in his congregation for a quiet moment or two then began his discourse in a very different strain it was not long before i guessed that he had lately received much the same sharp reminder of the gliding propensities of time as had come to me in amesbury when listening to the song of the river i judged him to have been thinking a good deal on the matter of late as i myself had been doing only in his case apparently no wise old man had come to his elbow with counsel such as had put my own dubities at rest the problem of how to grow old cropped up continually in the trend of the sermon but each time he touched upon it i could not see that he brought a solution much nearer rather he called down about it obscuring thoughts of melancholy and foreboding which a courageous resignation seemed to harden rather than temper and the deeper he got into his subject the more profoundly it seemed to lead him into troubled and tentative paths he had loved life well i should say and small blame to him and it was a sore thing though he would not own to it to see it slipping away his words seemed to carry a vision of life as a voyage on a river whose course had lain many leagues through spangled meadow and prosperous sunshine but now there was visible ahead a wall of ominous grey mist into which the river flowed and vanished to come out again no doubt into a greater brilliance and prosperity than ever but through what dark interval and when he began with rather an over refinement of manner the pregnant words clogged as i thought by too perfect breeding in a sincere earnest man i guessed as he warmed to his work that he would sooner or later break away from these cobweb manacles the aegis of his office and that the true naked souled man would win boldly out and so it happened always with complete reserve and restraint never letting his voice lift above its steady level the strong nature of the man began to vibrate and heave under the suave exterior and professional gravity and importance and in the end he made a great triumph out of his very difficulties there was no doubt of the meaning he flashed to us then old age must come death must come we must all pass into the valley of the shadow these were great mysteries 
if you can admit their truth and still face them all without a tremor of foreboding well then you are more than human more than i see how the shadows gather round the way and will not be denied and yet be of good heart there is still something the one great saving clause to be reckoned with it was all told not in these words nor in any words but by a look an eloquent pause a bowed head and then the spoken line clear and low in the silence abide with me fast falls the eventide End of chapter 19chapter twenty of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the amenities of coal heaving there was quite a string of traffic going my way out of winchester on monday morning standing under the great statue of king alfred that guards the southern approach to the town i let the first two or three vehicles go by as unsuited for my leisurely purpose finally deciding on a coal cart partly because of its deliberate pace and partly because the driver looked more than ordinarily interesting twenty years experience of amateur vagrancy up and down england has failed altogether to account for one fact about country coal heavers they are invariably gentlemen it would seem that there is something about coal dealing that refines and humanizes a man i have only a small acquaintance with those who dig it out of mines and none with those who vend it in the great populated centres but in country districts i have never fallen in with a coal peddler without being morally the better for it and not only are they men of sound social parts very often you will find them possessed of knowledge that can be come by only through close observation and diligent reflection one will tell you the name of every bird in the hedgerow as you journey on by his side another may be deeply versed in weather lore a coal heaver who once gave me a lift on a starry night in devonshire told me the names of all the constellations and in his spare time amused himself by drawing horoscopes the winchester coalman made me a seat on his near shaft out of some empty coal sacks which he beat against the wheel until they were fairly clean he himself rode on the other shaft his long legs dangling almost to the ground and before we had gone half a mile i was so impressed by his intelligence that i ventured to broach this very matter to him his first words put an instant new light on the subject coals said he is heavy stuff and dirty stuff and thirsty ain't the word for it then you sells them to women mostly then you takes them a long way miles into the country and you must sit and think or look about ye for hours together then there's good profit to it a man may keep a better home about him by coal sellin than by most other things if he can stand the life but that's just where it is tain't the coal as makes the man tis the coal that breaks him leastways all but one kind o him many try it but only one sort o man thrives at the work if you've nought but a strong back ye're no good at coal sellin you must hear head and heart as well as body there's the dust and the loneliness once let them drive you to the public house and you're done there's the women again you must be spry and politeful look clean under your dirt 
allers ha the right word to each other and the right coal at the right time or trade will go to northen and there's the hardship and long hours out in all weathers and meals no time or any time now where will you find your coal man one here and there in a score maybe i allers says as coal sellers is bishops and prize fighters spoiled there's another thing he went on thoughtfully flicking his whip at the binds of traveller's joy that reached out to us from the hedgerows a coal man he's allers passin the time o' day with folks come night time tain't company as he wants but quiet and fireside a home not an inn them as works alone in the fields gets together o nights over pipe and glass nature drives em to it but the coal seller thinks o nought then but his own chimney nook so he looks about him early to marry now when ye were wondering why coalmen are what they are did ye never think of looking at their wives i confessed i never had ah ye'd a learned more than i could tell ye he said impressively women is wonderful discernin they looks before they leaps tain't the flash young labourin man with fifteen shillings a week as gets the best o em tis the home lovin man as is earnin good money there's your coal man all over you see tis a woman question in the main arter all that was my first lift for the day and i decided it should be the last one though the morning was as fine as ever the northeast wind remained so piercingly cold that brisk walking was a constant necessity at the nearest village i left my coal peddler lustily shouting his wares down the street and pushed on alone i was now in the very heart of hampshire and well satisfied with my lot it was rolling open farm country with rich tracts of fine timber the foliage of the trees still wonderfully green the advance of autumn seemed here not merely arrested but turned back in its course though i had been steadily forging eastward since i had left the devon coast twelve days before there was no appreciable decline in the luxuriance of growth around me and here in hampshire there was something i had missed in the other counties traversed the ruddy warmth of red brick wall and roof there are of course brick and tile buildings everywhere in the land but among southern counties i have seen them nowhere in such profusion as in this stretch of country lying between winchester and the sussex border easton the first village i struck that day was principally of red brick and avington a few miles farther on lay smouldering in the same beautiful colour i have often thought that in one respect the tiled roof has a great advantage over the thatched roof inasmuch as it allows freer scope for one of nature's principal means of beauty giving from the modern housemaker's point of view the warping and sagging of timber is an unmitigated evil all his carefully wrought straight lines and true rectangles are destroyed his perpendiculars vitiated he cannot understand that a house which is newly built is as yet only like the babe just born after the building must come the growing sun and wind and rain must be allowed to work their will upon it and what a blessed thing the warping of timber really is can only be estimated by a study of these old tiled cottage roofs one in particular that i chanced upon during that morning's ramble would have whitened the hair of any modern builder the old artificers 
brought their wood to the old ads green or dry just as the mood beset them and from this house a hundred years of shower and sunshine had banished the last trace of the rectilinear if this slur had ever indeed rested upon it the entire building had been moulded by time into a maze of gentle curves and subsidences in the outset not a timber of its massive frame could have been square or straight nor was there a cube in the brick filling that tallied with its fellows all these had gone the road of picturesque evolution in the same loving comradeship together but it was in the roof that this natural growth out of the original crude rough and ready handiwork was chiefly evident if it had been thatched there would have been at most twenty years of this influence visible a good thatch will stand the score of winters but then it must be renewed and brought back to callow babyhood but a roof of british oak solidly laid together and tiled with the old porous tiles will come through centuries of storm and flood gathering upon it with each year only more grace and beauty looking at this old house it was difficult to escape the conclusion that either the house had shrunk or the roof got larger for the tiles drooped down over odd corners or overhung the windows in an otherwise inexplicable way from gable to gable the roof made a wavering hollow line intensely red against the blue sky some of the vertical beams had curved outward and some inward the horizontal rafters on which the tiles were hung festooned from beam to beam like a dew-laden spider web and thus the tiles spread downward on the steep roof side in an ever varying succession of ripples that seemed instinct with a gentle ebb and flow of life it is not easy to convey a real idea of the beauty of mere shape and pattern that the warping of the timbers had brought to the old roof but to tell of its colour would be frankly beyond the reach of any words or perhaps of any palate november sees the awakening of the mosses and lichens into active growth and life after the long summer drought the sagging winding action of the old beams and rafters had opened thousands of tiny chinks and crevices between the tiles and from each of them some minutely beautiful plant stretched forth tentacles of gold and green modern architects are using the red roof tile everywhere in their building and so far their action is commendable but it is not enough to copy the ancients in this without harking back still farther the art of tile making seems completely lost nowadays the modern roof tile is a hard glassy thing that only blackens under sunlight and the stress of weather it holds no moisture and nothing can ever root in it this old roof glowing in the autumn sunshine with a myriad soft hues of amber and umber and pearly grey owes its loveliness to the fact that the tiles hard and true burnt as they are still retain their original porous quality the lichen tendrils burrow into them and year by year make a braver show of beauty even slate can support some hardy forms of lichen life but the twentieth century roof tile is hopeless from the beginning nature can prevail against it no more than she can against corrugated iron towards the noon of that day i came down into what seemed to me the most silent deserted place in the world it was a tiny village lying at the bottom of a valley 
wound in shade and the sound of many waters but this incessant trickling near and far only served to intensify the silence that dwelt over it here and there a streak of blue smoke chevied away on the breeze i saw a dog asleep in a barrel and one child on a doorstep a solemn elderly child regaling on bread and butter who looked at me in mute appraisement as crusoe might have looked at a passing goat but no other human being was visible and as i wandered down the grass-grown street held by the slumberous quiet of the place its gloom the siren song of its waters there came over me the conviction that this child was indeed the sole representative of his race the eerie notion fixed itself in my mind perhaps he had never looked upon his kind before perhaps he had sat on that doorstep since the day some neglectful stork had dropped him there to munch and wait until he should be remembered and fetched away to somebody's cradle perhaps indeed he expected i had come to do it i turned at that thought and looked back with a sudden apprehension the child had got to his feet he was toddling towards me holding out his bread and butter as though he offered it for passage money into the unknown the wind swept overhead with a derisive shrillness all about me the waters murmured their slow incantation the air of the place seemed to thicken with an imminent purpose against me and still the child came on these queer moments of obsession are very near to folly yet they are seldom the experience of fools you cannot wave a belief in an abiding spirit to places if you go much in ancient human haunts and alone and here i felt the solitary little settlement deep in its grey cleft of valley to have got some mysterious and unholy lien upon me i took one more glance at the child stealthily creeping and peering towards me i saw now what i had not seen before a sallow craft the cunning of elfdom in his eyes i knew him then for more than he seemed a terror of his bread and butter seized upon me i turned and fled up the woodland path towards the far-off blotch of sunlight that marked for me the safe normality of the open road End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Eloquent Signpost. At the top of the hill, I came full upon a thing that drove this uncanny infant completely out of my mind and at once sent me off hot foot on another adventure it was only a signpost and bore only two words but these words brought back to me a history that once had filled all men's thoughts from end to end of the land to titchbourne it is not so wonderful that we should remember so many of the incidents of our childhood as that childish memory should retain or discard on such a capricious and inconsequent plan i must have been a very small boy indeed when the great titchbourne case stirred all men's minds and filled all newspapers but though it must have been a typically uninteresting thing to a child the details of the case hold in my memory now with a strange clearness this was no doubt due to the fact that every evening my father read out aloud 
the entire day's report of the trial and i was forced to listen and that in silence held severely still in the lap of a maiden aunt i was a devoted partisan of the claimant from the beginning his friend and financier gilbert onslow took rank in my mind with moses and david and oliver cromwell and all the other stalwart redressers of human wrongs i would have kissed the dust from the boots of dr keneally and cheerfully burnt lady tichborne at the stake but the great reason for my present joy at sight of the signpost has still to be told in these now woefully distant days i had registered a vow on the back cover of my maver's spelling book that i would see three places before i died these three places were jerusalem new orleans and tichborne and here at last lay one of them on my direct line of route i came down into tichborne through some of the fairest woods and fattest pastures it had ever been my lot to behold england the old merry prosperous england epitomized herself here in the land of los sir roger and the village itself was the true focus of it all there was tichborne house standing a little way off deep in a maze of old apple trees and girt about with an ancient red brick wall there was the tichborne arms crimson curtained bright with new paint and polished window glass where no doubt the retired butlers of centuries had laid up their comfortable bones there was the square grey battlemented church full as i conceived of tichborne family monuments and there were the little black and white thatch cottages grouped decorously and respectfully on the two sides of the winding village street exhaling feudalism and snug dependence from every poor i sat down by the village well to rest and smoke and reflect upon it all i looked at the tidy street the blooming gardens the easy poverty and content of service that basked around me i looked at the fine old family mansion nestling like a prize hen among her plebeian chickens i thought of the broad acres the dukely rent roll a whole countryside as it were eternally pulling its forelock and crooking its knee and my hearty sympathy or at least understanding went out to covetous clever arthur orton and stood fraternally by him on that momentous day when from his outpost in arlesford he put together that deep scheme which by so little came to such utter naught as i thus pondered there arrived at the well an opulent-looking old gentleman in a smock and gaiters bearing two pails on a milkman's yoke he set these down with a clank and proceeded to draw water and i for my part desiring to draw information helped him to wind up the rope many's the bucket of water said i by way of preliminary that has journeyed up this dark lane since poor arthur orton's time the old gentleman gave me a quick glance then he looked up the road and down the road finally looking at me again be ye visitin at the great house he asked cautiously oh no i'm only a stranger passing through well now he came a step nearer look ye here a minute he came quite close i'll tell ee somewhat he half whispered the words into my ear arthur orton there never were no such person arthur orton don't ee get talkin o that to the old folk hereabout or you'll soon have a straight word from the shoulder 
twere poor sir roger his very own self had no other soul in the world so help me lord he said it as though he were making a solemn affidavit and having said it he drew back to study its effect but see now i always believed in him as you do yet when he came out of prison he wrote the whole story for the papers confessing that he was arthur orton and the entire thing a fraud how do you get over that the old gentleman smiled incredulously i were paid to do it i were an old man and a poor man i were broke in mind and body and here were a bit of money to be had no blame to an either i did it because i were paid to do it i tell ee but they would have paid just as much for tichborne's story as for arthur orton's story they only wanted the truth you know he smiled more incredulously than ever see ye yeah, whoever ye be i knowed young sir roger a proper wild lad as ever drew breath i mind well when i went away to foreign parts and i seed and many's the time when i come back and they yonder tried to fix it on un as a were arthur orton but i knowed un i tell ee and as old nurse knowed un as they clapped into the mad house purty quick to shut her mouth like but you might both have been mistaken sir roger went away a boy and the one who came back claiming to be sir roger tichborne was a man well on in life and a hard life too even if it had really been sir roger he must have been entirely altered and you could hardly have known his face the old gentleman regarded me with scorn now as well as incredulity his face i never lowed as i knowed his face nor no one else didn't twas the words as proved the man listen now i comes up to in yonder twere the same man keepin it look ye as i went away hello says he ye've moved a picture from that there wall as i used to be very fond o a fine picture in a gold frame and with gold all over the back what's come to it says he sure as i stands here the very same picture were in the house still and there were the gold back just as i said another thing now i went ridin maybe with mr onslow as stood his friend through thick and thin and lost eighteen thousand pound by it they was riding along together and says sir roger sudden like ah there used to be a gate here as many a time i've rode through just here where the bushes is growed up Arterwards they dug up the place and sure as i live there was the stumps of the old gate posts underground buried and forgotten what might you say to that there was nothing to be said and he went on ay i could tell you stories and the old woman get no water from now to carol time but this and i'll finish ye sir roger a come through a old garden hereby and says he pointin see that tree i planted that tree i did with my own hands years afore i went away and what do you think i put underneath a root on it i put a girt big stone there and there you'll find it still and sure as ye has eyes to your face find it they did just as he told em ay i were poor sir roger right a now and no other livin soul that noon i lunched at the tichborne arms as a right and a bounden duty the wind was still blowing hard and cold in my face when i took the road again but the country was so charming that i paid little heed to this the whole afternoon was just a pleasant saunter from one pretty village to another through low-lying but infinitely diversified scenery towards sundown however 
i got tired of the winding white lanes and the face of man and yielding to a sudden fit of vagabondage climbed over the nearest gate making straight ahead through a vista of trackless green pastures the ruddy light full in my eyes it was wanton flagrant trespass no doubt and therein both culpable and irresistible i went as it were with my life in my hand through an enemy's country and every step was fraught with a sweet peril i began the tramp as a mere scout but the fancy rapidly developed after i had scrambled through half a dozen hedges crossed a field of rape and breasted a hazel copse or two i promoted myself to the moccasins of leather stocking thence on coming to a sunny bit of valley full of lowing milch kine with a patch of red farmstead in the middle it was an easy change to one of the spies in canaan but i was still to play my star part i skirted the valley unseen swung myself across a brook by means of an overhanging ash branch then finding myself on the brink of a wild forest country i got me on the lincoln jerkin of robin hood i was tired enough of that character and of this particular merry greenwood before i was done with them for the first half hour i moved in a very aureola of romance it were easy to believe that no human foot had ever trodden that mossy path before far ahead the saffron of the sunset glittered through the trees above me the oaks made a close-knit russet canopy and behind there was the blue night coming up hand over hand like a dusky enemy in pursuit rabbits broke continually across the path hares ran on ahead or played in the quiet glades to left and right of me the deep bugle call of pheasants went to and fro in the wood everywhere there was the last sleepy twittering of the birds as they settled to roost but soon the rich light for which i was staring paled and lowered the darkness gained upon and overran and passed me at length it filled all the wood a ground mist sprang up so that i could scarce see the trend of the path a dozen feet away and still against the thin scarlet line that divided the darkness of earth and sky the tree-tops crowded one behind the other and every furlong i covered seemed to reveal unnumbered and impenetrable leagues ahead starlight has always an alluring poetic flavour about it and when there is a hard road underfoot and he is sure of his way the traveller need ask for no brighter company but in the midst of a wood of unknown extent with night long since fallen and hunger and fatigue dogging his heels a full moon and plenty of milestones are more to his purpose the stars and the last dull patch in the west were however all i had to guide me that night and a good hour went by before the trees began to thin about me and i came out at last upon an open way here the woods ended and the country fell away abruptly beneath i stopped at the first clear point of outlook and scanned the dark gulf below to my great joy i saw a little blur of lights close at hand and as i trudged down the steep lane towards it a church clock struck denoting a village of some extent ten minutes later i reached the place as far as i could make out in the darkness it was as pretty as anything i had ever seen the church stood in the midst of it the street dividing and curving round each side of the graveyard 
without there was almost a complete circle of houses all facing towards the church some fine old elms towered up against the stars on the north side i heard the drumming of water over a weir not far off but i was too tired and hungry to concern myself much over its beauties then i unshipped my rucksack and set about the task of looking for board and bed i made the round of the place twice before i spied a queer little cottage standing somewhat back from the street the door of it stood open giving a view of the lighted interior and every now and then a strange cry drifted out upon the still night air that at once attracted my attention rain a comin rain a comin joe the words were uttered in a harsh strident mocking voice though perfectly distinct i ought to have known them at once for a parrot's yet it was not until i had listened and heard them repeated three or four times over that this explanation of the curious cry occurred to me and then i loitered up to the door and casually glanced in there was a little round table spread for a meal there was a glowing wood fire before which sat a very small white-headed old man on a three-legged stool placidly toasting bacon on his shoulder perched the parrot a mass of internecine colour blue and scarlet and green and all around him fixed to the walls sheathed in the corners or displayed on the mantelpiece were countless weapons of war but every one of a savage kind assegais knobkerries hideous curved scimitars and knives an old matchlock or two fantastically ornamented with beads all this i took in at a first glance and then found myself staring into the little old man's face and he into mine for he had suddenly turned and discovered me i did not delay an explanation i was just passing said i and heard your parrot calling out what a voice there is to him but he is wrong this time by the look of the night it cannot rain for weeks this rather deft resort to the side issue was perfectly successful i could see at once that my rudeness of intrusion was in a fair way of being forgiven and even forgotten the old man smiled wisely then he stuck his tongue into his lower lip craftily blinking both eyes rain a comin rain a comin joe the old man fondled the screaming gewgaw into silence ah said he with ineffable meaning ah do ye say that now i'll tell ye what i'll do i'll wager my sunday coat as it'll rain hard afore mornin for all your fine nights now then he landed the fizzling bacon into a dish at his side and began on another rasher tis like this he went on ye heard and cried joe my name bent joe twere my old father as were a sea captain and a great traveller i brought home all his hair stickers and clubs and things and the parrot were his'n and him and the parrot they sailed many a voyage together i larned the parrot a sight o things and the parrot larned thee more's the pity but one thing the parrot knowed of his own self better an my father though a were fifty year on the sea i knowed the weather upside and downside if i set to callin wind a comin joe there was all hands to shorten the sail directly minute and so twer with the rain and so tis still i tell ee i can't be beat the old man had talked himself into such a condition of glowing bonhomie 
that i ventured now on the thing that had been uppermost in my own thoughts i explained to him my position and asked him if he could tell me where i could find a lodging for the night he thought it over a while would just a little small cupboard of a room not no size at all content ye anyhow i told him i should be glad of the simplest accommodation and just a bite o common whittles such as a lone widow man ud do we that's all i want in the world then bide along o me he said and put more bacon on the spit End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain a song before sunrise it was towards daybreak but still dark as pitch when i woke in my little cupboard room under the thatch and at once threw off all the bedclothes it had turned stifling hot while i slept i had set the window open as far as it would go and overnight the room had been perfectly sweet and cool but now it was hot and close as an oven and all round the little house i could hear the rain pouring down a steady thudding note on the thatch overhead and below a sound as of countless rills and freshets babbling joyously together as they coursed along the street i got out of bed and kneeling down by the little square hole of a window crowded head and shoulders through the air outside was just like a draught of hot spiced wine the warm rain seemed to have liberated a thousand odours from the parched earth in the dense shrubbery of the churchyard opposite i could make out a dim crepitation and stir of life as though every twig and branch was stretching itself gladly and expanding its cold cramped fibres in the new warmth and wet towards the east there was a grey patch coming in the darkness and now in the thicket of yew and laurel a thrush began to pipe such a pipe as i had not heard for many a long day it was just like tears of molten silver dropping through the darkness tears born of joy for the thrush's song is never sad what makes the first bird sing in the dawn i have often wondered you can understand the earliest pearl grey light kindling a common gladness through the woods this happens every morning in the year when there is a touch of south in the breeze and when summer is at her zenith the woodlarks sing all night through and then it is only a case of the lighter sleeper first awakened but in season or out of season there is always one bird and this ever a thrush that feels the day coming before its fellows my thrush in the churchyard sang alone as yet it was so dark that i could see nothing beyond the dripping eaves of the thatch but a silhouette of tree-tops black against the livid eastern sky the rain soused down harder than ever straight vertical rods of water that reaching the hard road broke into a fine white mist just discernible in the gloom below but neither storm nor darkness made any odds to the singer he piped on with a reckless energy as though he believed the coming of the day depended entirely on the power of his magic flute it was a robin that first heard this glad reveille there came two or three half-hearted apologetic trills from the depths of the nearest bush and then apparently he tucked his head under his other wing and slumbered again 
for i heard no more of him but now the grey light was mounting apace nothing in feathers could sleep surely in the fair way of that torrent of music one by one other thrushes joined in chaffinches began to clink in the thicket the note of a bullfinch like a quick short breath over the top of a key went about from bush to bush i could hear the starlings clucking and whistling on the roof ridge of the church and close to my ear the sparrows were creeping like mice out of their holes in the thatch and already quarrelling noisily at length still leaning through the tiny window i guessed by the broadening light that the sun was up but at best it was only a bolder twilight for the sky was great with cloud and the rain pelted down with a grimmer determination than ever i now heard the old cottager moving in the room below me and i hastened to dress i found him occupied in exactly the same way as i had discovered him the night before sitting on the three-legged stool and toasting bacon with the parrot clambering about on his shoulder the old man turned me a triumphant face as i came in look at that now said he pointing to the streaming window glass what did i tell ye as fine a rain as ever come out o heaven his enthusiasm easily transcended my own the last thing i had done before leaving winchester had been to send my waterproofs on by post judging them to be only a useless encumbrance in the sunshine that seemed by then invincible at the time i had plumed myself on my foresight as much as i now regretted it but repining would not mend the matter it looked as though i had a long wet day to face and i must contrive against it as best i could we sat down to the meal and the three of us the old man the parrot and i held a council of war together i must go on said i at last though i do not want to get wet is there no covered wagon or cart going my way this morning the old man slapped his thigh ay there be bilet that there be he cried only just remembering it bilet the carrier as comes through on's road to petersfield every tuesday yer in luck tis the very day no sooner had he said it than we heard a steady scrunching of wheels in the street and my host darted out to interview the carrier while he was gone and i was getting my traps together the parrot who throughout the meal had been merely whistling or indulging in irrelevant seafaring profanity now found his voice to a new strain storm and shine joe storm and shine storm and shine i looked at the leaden sky and the unremitting deluge and felt this to be an exasperating foul indeed shine i thought to myself disconsolately it will never shine again but his master who then returned had no sooner heard the new cry then he was exclaiming again at my luck as all is right said he twill clear within the hour sure as big taters come from little uns i consulted bilet on this point when presently we were journeying on together and discovered in him a great curiosity to wit an outdoor man who honestly confessed himself ignorant on the subject of weather bilet sat on the front board and talked back over his shoulder to me while i sat under the wagon tilt behind snugly out of reach of the rain the old grey horse his ears back and his head lowered to the deluge 
splashed on before us at a steady four miles an hour parrots quoth bylet indignantly what call ha they foreign animals a comin here and layin down the law o things when our own old rooks and crows knows naught about it and they bred and born in the place ye never can tell the rights o it from one hour to the next in this country what's afore your eyes that ye knows and no more tis rainin at this very minute put out your hand and ye feels it now look away yonder what might you make of that i stared along his pointing whip handle there was an undeniable patch of blue coming in the grey it looked as though the parrot were right after all and with much diffidence i suggested this to bylet parrot or no parrot he maintained stoutly ye never can tell tis even heads or tails all the time if it don't rain or shine twill gloam and more no livin man let alone green and yaller furrin beast can say however in a little while the rattle of the rain on the wagon tilt ceased a wisp of watery sunshine came racing over the meadows towards us revealing the fact that there had been no rain at all but just a mighty downfall of diamonds which now rimmed and spangled everything with their changing iridescent light thus heartened i began to take an interest in the world once more you are going to petersfield i asked the carrier er that's almost due south isn't it ah what is this place we are going down into now selborne what i cried jumping up in the cart so tis maybe ye never heerd on it tis but a little small place i hastily got out my map there was no doubt about it i was back in selborne the selborne of gilbert white after an absence of twenty years i parted company with bylet then and let him go on ahead when the grating of his wagon wheels had died away at the bottom of the hill i set about making my own breath-baited entry into the place alone i think i shall never go to selborne again as long as i live indeed it is no longer possible to go there except by one road that of the wise calm imperishable book all other ways are closed the very village itself obliterated by the glacier-like march of money evil days of prosperity have fallen upon the place it is indescribably swept and garnished the old rough hollow lanes have disappeared and beautifully engineered thoroughfares set to lure the sharabangs rich folk have settled on selborne thick as flies there are shops that would not disgrace a back street in balham with my pack and miry boots and well-worn clothes i felt like a suspicious character as much out of place as a pickpocket in rotten row i pushed on between the immaculate show cottages of the village street past white's old parsonage now apparently somebody's country house and out on the sunny plestor the ancient playing place of selborne another big shop stared at me here from a neighbouring corner but otherwise to my great delight the place was unchanged there was the old tree in its centre with the seat round it just such another tree and seat as must have stood there in white's day between the cobblestones the mayweed raised its well-remembered feathery fronds and by the churchyard wall roses still bloomed though it was mid-november just the same loose pink roses 
gently swaying on curving wands of green that i had sentimentalized over so many years ago i raised the latch of the churchyard gate and passed in that is a hard word i have just written but i suppose a true one looking back on it now through the vista of twenty sane and sobering years the pilgrimage i then made to the shrine of gilbert white stands out as nothing less than an orgy of sentimentalism that it was so sincerely and unconsciously that my every thought and act at the time was a pure unforced affair of the heart and no design conceit only aggravates the case no writer nor draughtsman i think comes to the fullness of his powers whatever they may be quite by the same devious paths the same tilting at windmills the exploiting of the same blind alleys yet all have to look back on much the same reiterated fellow de se the piling by the way of those dead selves that lead or so often do not lead to higher things on that never to be forgotten day when i first came to selborne churchyard to look for the grave of gilbert white i went straight to the most gorgeous monument i could see believing in those callow times that the greatest dead always lay in the fairest tombs but to-day i knew better where to seek him in the quietest leafiest corner almost the humblest among the crowding graves i found and stood by the stone again noting how the ivy still wreathed about it and the moss and lichen shrouded it in golden green g w twenty six june seventeen ninety three there was nothing else upon the stone and even these simple letters were hardly to be deciphered for the splaying lichens i looked at it a while silently then turned away and as i turned the sunlight paled and was gone the wind dirged faintly in the old grey church tower over the hanging woods a rain cloud dragged its grisly curtain and drove me helter skelter to the haven of the inn here while the storm went by i sat over a pipe and a mug of hampshire brew conning the visitors books the new gilt-lettered one and the old dog-eared books whose entries go back thirty years or more all manner of men have made this pilgrimage to selborne i found huxley's name here in eighty nine and with it that of lord napier the signatures of other men almost as distinguished cropped up here and there in the time-stained page and they are still coming daily and will come i suppose while love of the great truths of nature interpreted by great art still forms part of the mind equipment of the world's great men the rain kept up its tattoo on the window glass and for want of other occupation i went on turning the well-thumbed leaves the books were full of names and the commentaries of people from all ends and beginnings of the earth it was only to be expected that selborne would prove for gushing enthusiasts a lodestar of nearly equal magnitude with stratford on avon and here they were hundreds of them all self-written down after the name of their kind opening the book at random this thing first caught my eye a cold and frosty morning all nature robed in white shade of gilbert forgive the unpremeditated pun what manner of man could have written it i wondered and passed idly on my next halt was at a couplet in blank verse original i should judge 
and i said if there's peace in this world to be found a heart that is humble might hope for it here only some wag had erased all the aspirates in the second line and somewhat marred the effect on every page almost ignorance had set down some such nauseating outburst in praise of either the man the book or the place let these stand for example white's history of selborne would do for the diary of adam in eden selborne is the earthly paradise of beauty one forgets all the sin and sorrow of the world in this divinely lovely place and again what a boon to the jaded human toiler such a man of genius such an immortal book and such a ravishingly beautiful spot of earth but the mass of trite twaddle was not without its leavening of humour here and there one traveller arriving on a blusterous day and desiring to record some incident evidently witnessed on the road writes or quotes as follows the devil he sent a great high wind which blew her skirts sky high but the good lord sent a cloud of dust which lodged in the bad man's eye some busybody also had added to the usual adulatory passage about selborne a condensed biography of gilbert white in which he stated that white was vicar of the place under this in another hand was written this writer is mistaken gilbert white was never vicar of selborne it was his father who held this post in yet another handwriting and under another date we read you are both mistaken the white who figures on the parish registers as sometime vicar of selborne was really the grandfather of the immortal gilbert this was evidently too much for the patience and good sense of another traveller who came later for a fourth note is scribbled under the other three you are all wrong it was his grandmother the storm passed as swiftly as it came now the sunshine filled the little room with its sudden gladness and revealed to me that i was sitting in a fog of stale dust motes when a couple of strides would bring me out into pure clean air i took my way down the sloppy glittering street looking about me at the beech-clad hills that hem in the place the rich meadows the fine view eastward over woolmer forest murky blue and mist laden now in the showery times the country round selborne is undoubtedly pretty and on that changing glamorous morning it must have looked well nigh at its best but even when viewed under all favour and advantage it is impossible to concede to selborne the supremacy claim for it by those unblushing and unbalanced scribes if there had never been a gilbert white i doubt if a single one of these laudatory gentry in making a tour of this part of hampshire would have stopped a day in the place or singled it out as anything above its fellows and therein if we come to consider it lies the highest word of praise that can be bestowed on selborne's immortal chronicler the very fact that selborne though pretty is not especially beautiful shows us the man in his true light white's genius and not its own peculiar merit has made all men proclaim selborne as the fairest of earthly edens which assuredly it is not for providence seldom wastes her richest human material on superlatives 
he of the one talent may be sent to the mountain tops but the million faceted soul is kept to labour in the universe of common every day it was the great privilege of gilbert white to live in the midst of normality he wrote not of an unmatched paradise but of a stretch of country that was just a type of rural england no more and no less that he found in it beauty and truth illimitable is matter in praise not of selborne but of the great beauty and truth-giver whose will it is that these good things should be set in humble ways we should still have had the natural history and the yet finer calendar if instead of in selborne gilbert white had been destined to live and work on peckham rye End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain hey ho for the wind and the rain thanks to my early start from the parrot cottage the morning was still young it was barely eleven o'clock when i left selborne and pushed on at a good pace designing to make what progress i could while the fair interval of weather lasted i had also another motive which with me counted easily first i knew selborne lay only six miles from the sussex border it is with the sussex man as with the scot he can be happy enough in other lands if sufficiently far away but bring him within measurable distance of his native down or heather and he is all eagerness to get them under his feet it was the instinct of the homing pigeon that awoke in me then and for the next few miles urged me onward the bright spell between the showers served to carry me through empshot over the main farnham and petersfield road and some way into the wild and lonely forest country beyond i got a lift in a farm wagon just clear of selborne and another in the pony trap of a coal porter farther on and i was in full enjoyment of a novel experience riding astride of an enormous beech trunk on a timber trolley with four steaming horses thunderously tramping on in single line before me when the black sky seemed to split asunder and let down a solid mass of water the woodman trudging on beside his leading horse took no heed of the downfall but for myself i was in no mind to sit there and drown i slipped off my perch to the ground and crowded into the shelter of the wayside trees that here grew thick and close i was to learn as it proved a great deal about rain before that day was over the roadside bank was sandy and hollow and overroofed by the spreading oak branches not a drop reached me where i stood i had nothing therefore to do but wait and study the thing before me the shower was short but never i verily believe had it rained before as it rained then everything in my view was blotted out by the descending cataract the sound of its falling was like the continuous roar of an angry sea the water fell black on the road before me springing up instantly a yard high in a milk-white mist of spray though the deluge could not reach me under the bank a stream of water began to flow round my feet so that i must dig out footholds in the sandy wall and partly by these partly by clinging on to the roots above i must lift myself as best i could out of the charging freshet 
and then as suddenly as it came the storm cloud drove by on the southwest wind the sunlight poured out of the heaven i took the road once more the only dry thing in the whole smiling ruddy wilderness i bethought me however as i went along that but for the kindly shelter of the bank i might have been as wet as the dripping foliage above me and i resolved to provide against another such chance about a mile farther on i came up with a solitary little inn with a stable yard at its side at the gate of which stood the ostler a lean and melancholy white cocking lacklustre eye to the weather by this time it had fallen grey again and another shower seemed imminent i went up to this ostler full of an idea that now occurred to me do you think said i you could find me an old driving cape or anything that will keep out the water something that i can throw away when i get to the end of my journey he received this in blank astonishment and as he stared at me the rain came flooding down again come inside said he still looking at me as if i were the most amazing phenomenon in his experience i dunno an old cape did you say well now maybe as i could would an old top coat serve ye anyways he produced the coat it was a coachman's coat in stout boxcloth and had once been of a rich chocolate brown but was now faded to a nondescript clay colour it had facings of buff and some of its big horn buttons still clung to it it fitted me and to spare i looked round the harness room now give me some of that old tarpaulin enough to make leggings with and a cover for the camera by the help of a knife and some string this was soon effected outside the rain was coming down not in temporary wrath as before but with a steady swing to it as though it had set in for the day i took another searching look round the room can i have that it was an ancient stiff felt hat round topped and with ample brim the very thing to ward off the elements i pocketed my cap and set off through the rain a couple of shillings poorer in purse but richer by an equipment that saving thunderbolts was proof against all malignancies of weather one among the most illustrious of our fiction mongers has given us a phrase that deserves if it may not achieve immortality having plunged his characters over head and ears in a slough of disaster he gives the problem up and standing aside inveighs against the perfidy of circumstance that things work together for good or ill apart from human volition must be more than suspected by any careful student of life and i was now to find in myself an apt confirmation of this when i first set out on my roving excursion through the five counties nothing had been farther from my thoughts than to attempt any disguises but circumstances whether perfidious or benevolent had now led me into this very thing without any preconcerted design of my own there i was trudging along the king's highway as seedy and dilapidated a tramp as might be found in the kingdom from looking the part to acting it was not i found so great a step as it appeared i had hardly covered another mile before i felt the slouching gait and the hangdog look of the peripatetic casual breaking out all over me by the time i got to rake which stands on the sussex border the rain had put the finishing touch to my disguise 
and i set foot on my native soil at last waterlogged and mud bespattered a happy and frankly irredeemable vagabond in this picturesque array of mind and body i wandered on for the rest of the day caring nothing for the rain caring only that the ground beneath my feet was good sussex ground and that every step now brought me nearer and nearer to that green downland heart of it where lay my own roof tree and home the fierce gusty spell of weather was over a thick white fog had come up on the dropping breeze and through this there fell a constant drizzle that neither increased nor abated but steadily did its worst until the night and yet every mile i covered under these unhelpful conditions was full of a real traveller's joy the old coat and the tarpaulin leggings and that precious hat whose willowy brim shot the water off a good three inches on either side kept me perfectly dry the woods and hedgerows about me rang with the happy songs of birds rejoicing in the new warmth that had transformed the whole countryside i could see nothing of the landscape for the enveloping mist but i knew my own homeland lay about me and in fancy i surrounded the way with the richest and most inspiring scenery and bethought me all the time of the hidden sun above i got no more lifts that day no one offers to lift the professional tramp and i found my garb so effective that not only did the ordinary traffic of the road pass me by without a look but the very labourers i met withheld their common greetings in the villages i encountered the same almost surly ostracism everywhere people turned away from their doors as i passed in the tap-room of the inn where i lunched the landlord kept possession of the pot of ale and bread and cheese which i had ordered until the money for them was safely in his hand in one place a constable maintained me severely under his eye following me at a distance until i had slouched my way out of his jurisdiction all through that rainy misshrouded afternoon i spoke with only two human creatures the first was a ragged hulking fellow whom i overtook on the road and who insisted on bearing me company but i found his conversation so foul and his general outlook on life so malodorous that i soon gave him a decisive good day and forged on ahead the only other fellow-creature with whom i held parley was a road-mender i came upon him towards late afternoon in a little hamlet called elstead lying though i never suspected it then in the enveloping mist close under the first bluff escarpment of the sussex downs he was a serene old man with bow legs and mild blue eyes and he seemed to have the village to himself save that from the little schoolhouse hard by there came the low tumult of children's voices i stopped really to listen to this pleasant rivulet of sound stemming out upon the dismal twilight but the old man mistook the action he gave over scraping in the gutter and looked cheerfully my way travellin be ye said he with a pleasant nod in his voice there was a kind hearty ring that strangely affected me it was the first genial word and look i had received for many a long hour i drew a little nearer yes i've come a long way and it's hard going in the rain have you seen many of my sort passing through to-day he thought a little his chin on the handle of his hoe no said he at length 
plenty of other sorts but nane o' your sort what sort do you take me to be then he hesitated and i could see he was casting about for a gentle way to put it ah he said presently chopping away at the weeds again trouble comes and comes to high and low i ha seed it and i knows jedge not and ye won't be jedged that's what i allers says this somehow nettled me i was willing to pass as an out-and-out -out incorrigible tramp but to be taken for a broken-down gentleman had in it a mysterious quality of offence i wondered whether it would have hurt me at all or hurt me more if my case had been as he suspected where does that road lead to i asked him he shook the water from his hat that there that goes by stedham on the middest twill be your road i reckon why my road i could see he was in a difficulty again well now they others they mostly ask for that way for midhurst ay he stopped and then surprised me by flushing red to his hat brim midhurst you know the the labourin house no offence mister i do hope that i do we were both in the same confusion now no said i i'm not thinking of going there to-night i hate towns where does that other road take you to batten through bepton to cocken purty nigh fower mile tis but ye're a smartish bit wet a-ready mister bain't ye i told him i was dry enough underneath whereupon by no means misunderstanding me he nevertheless went to his basket that was tucked under the ivy of the school wall and drew forth a tin bottle tis home brewed he said and ye are very welcome water ye've had to-day and to spare so a change o liquor won't harm ye i drank gratefully to the fine sensitive souled old man devoutly hoping that there were many more like him in the land and as i drank there came from the schoolhouse behind me a flood of what seemed then the most exquisite music all the children were singing together an evening hymn now the day is over night is drawing nigh shadows of the evening steal across the sky at the sound of it the old road scraper began to gather up his tools hark ye he said smiling i lows that's about the last touch school'll be up in a minute and i'll be getting home along he walked with me to the corner here as i was turning away he put a fatherly hand on my sleeve see now said he i don't rightly know how tis we ye but come night time if ye turns in to sleep anywheres in a barn or the like mind well as ye asked leave o' the farmer first else there might be trouble for ye they're terrible sharp hereabouts but i was in no mood for that kind of adventure already the darkness was looming up behind me and the rain as inexorable as ever by the time i reached cocking i was heartily sick and tired of vagabondage just clear of the village i took off coat and hat and leggings and rolling them up together threw them over the nearest gate ten minutes later i was toasting my wet boots before a cottage fire listening all at once to the sizzle of a point stake in a frying pan the talk of a ninety-year-old grandfather and the prattle of a child who had climbed upon my knee my luck was in again End of chapter 23